Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Joseph Jansen. I'm an assistant professor of agricultural economics here at Montana State University. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the economics of crop rotation. Um, and given that we're looking at crop rotation in a Montana context, uh, we're going to focus specifically on pulse crops and, and how they might fit into crop rotations uh, that we might that uh, growers might use here in our state, uh, and particularly think about the relative profitability of different uh, crop rotation options and how we might think about that and how you can uh, adapt some tools uh, to your specific context to help you choose uh, the most successful and profitable crop rotation for your operation. So just before we get started, uh, I want to think about what are pulse crops. Uh, pulse crops uh, are a, a term that we use to um, capture a whole bunch of different uh, things that we might grow here in our state. So when we're thinking about Montana specifically, the pulse crops that we're thinking about are chickpeas, uh, also known as garbanzo beans, uh, lentils, and dry peas. And inside each of those crops is a whole number of different varieties uh, that growers uh, that have sort of that growers can grow that have specific end uses and specific markets. Uh, so we won't talk too much about sort of whether you should be growing green or red lentils uh, or yellow or green peas, uh, but we do because but we do want to think about how do these crops uh, fit into rotations? What are the benefits and costs of including them in a rotation? And in that sense. Uh, there are some similarities um, in terms of how they alter uh, the profitability of the farm. And so we'll talk about that uh, going forward. What I want to do today um, is first just sort of review what uh, I think growers should know about pulse crops, both in terms of sort of how do they fit uh, into, how do, does the U.S. and Montana fit into the world uh, of pulse crop production? Um, where do our pulse crops grow? Uh, and then uh, what, are, what sort of pricing can, do we see for pulse crops? There are two sort of unique things about pulses that I, I, I want to highlight because I think they're really important. That is the marketing contracts that are available for pulses uh, and the crop insurance options that are available. Uh, and those affect how pulse crops fit into the crop rotations that we, use, that we might want to use. So then I want to go into discussing um, how to plan crop rotations, and in particular, compare crop rotations that do or don't include pulse crops. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use a tool called enterprise budget analysis. So we're just going to think about essentially what is the what is the profitability of each of these different crops, and then what is their profitability if we grow them together in a given crop rotation. And so, how can we take some existing estimates of profitability, some existing crop budgets? and account for the benefits and costs of growing these crops in a particular rotation. So if you uh, get nothing else out of this, I hope you understand that, uh, you understand that uh, when we're thinking about profitability, it's not that we can't sort of simplify this down into, is one crop more profitable than the other? There are some uh, complementarities that exist uh, between different crops, and we want to account for those in thinking about uh, whether we're going to allocate acres to one crop or another. So pulse crop production, where, how, how big is it? Where does it fit? On the left side of this figure, um, on the left side of this figure, I've shown uh, corn and wheat production over the last 40, 45 years or so. And we can see that as world population has grown, right, the production of major food crops has gone up. So these, these lines are sort of upward sloping. Um, and today we grow about, for example, about 700 million metric tons of wheat worldwide. Uh, and about 10% or so of that um, is grown in the United States. The US is growing about 30 to 40% of the world's corn. So uh, one for our major crops, we're a major producer and, um, and production is large. For pulse crops, things are a little bit different. You can see that the y-axis on these graphs is totally different. Whereas we're growing hundreds of millions of metric tons of corn and wheat, we're growing only about you know, between two and 15 million metric tons in any given year uh, for pulse crops. We've seen 
post crop production in the world go up, especially for lentils, and uh, over here for for uh, for chickpeas. Uh, post crop production has has increased slightly over this period for peas, but uh, there is sort of a note was a noticeable decline between about 1990 and today, uh, and that's due in large part to um, the fact that feed use for peas is much lower, um, especially in Europe. So Europe used to use a lot of peas uh, as animal feed. They don't do that anymore. Um, but nonetheless, we've seen uh, some uh, an uptick in growth, at least over the last decade, uh, for dry peas as well. Thing to note here, right, is that pulse crop markets are just a lot smaller than the markets for our other major grains, right? And so, um, if we're thinking about how does this affect uh, the market opportunities that are available to growers, well, um, sometimes it's just a, lo a little bit harder. There's just less information. There are fewer buyers. Uh, and so uh, it can take longer for sort of market developments occur to occur in, the, in, the, in post markets relative to markets for wheat that we might be familiar with. Here's the story in Montana. Uh, this is just production. This is just U.S. and Montana production. So, how big is production in the United States? And then, what share is Montana of that uh, that production? We see that Montana is is a substantial share. Uh, whether we're talking about chickpeas, lentils, or dry peas, uh, really starting in the early 2000s, we were really uh, a, a negligible pulse crop producer, and that story has totally changed over time. Uh, to the point where we're producing about half of uh, U.S. pulses here in the state of Montana. Uh, 2016 was a particularly a banner year for U.S. pulse crop production. We had uh, record acreage. Um, and that's shown by the, the spike near the end of each of these uh, each of these series. So in 2016, here we had uh, record chickpea production, record lentil production, record pea production. Uh, both in the U.S. and Montana. Uh, 2017, we've seen significant declines, and that's sort of show, that's shown here. And a large part that's due to the drought that we experienced in our state. So we still planted about the same amount uh, of pulse acres, um, but uh, production was lower because uh, because we had uh, particularly poor weather. Where is that acreage coming from? Well, a significant portion of that is coming from fallow. So over this period, uh, Montana summer fallow acres dropped by about half. So from about 4 million acres to about two. And so a lot of that uh, allowed farmers to uh, adopt more diverse uh, crop rotations that included continuous cropping, that is uh, growing a crop every year, eliminating fallow from that rotation entirely. Um, and a lot of that was uh, allocated to these three crops, chickpeas, lentils, um, and dry peas. Where does this stuff go? Well, the reality is that we're exporting a significant percentage. The majority of it is going outside of the United States. Um, and India is our most important customer. So this graph shows just the share of dry peas and lentils. Uh, that we send outside of the U.S. every year, what share of that goes to particular countries. And we can see that this blue section over here, so about over a third of both our lentils and dry peas uh, are going to South Asia, and that most of that is India. So uh, what happens in India is crucially important uh, for the prices that farmers receive. Um, whereas our wheat exports go to a lot of different countries, our pulse exports are concentrated in a smaller number of countries, and because of that, uh, stuff that happens in that particular country has a bigger influence on price. So in, in India, uh, there are a whole host of things that can sort of shock that market. So the Indian government is very active in both uh, limiting or controlling trade, so we've had a number of uh, potential import bans put on by India that would sort of uh, reduce demand for U.S. pulses. Uh, India has also used uh, production incentives for its own growers to try and encourage domestic production. And again, that could be a negative 
for U.S. growers. Um, and finally, they've been, uh, they, the Indian government main, maintains large stockpiles of pulses. Um, and so when they sell out of that stockpile, that can also lower market prices. So it's something to be aware of um, that what happens there has a big influence on price. The other thing to note is that food aid, uh, that is pulse crops purchased by the US government and donated uh, for humanitarian assistance in developing countries is really important, especially uh, in the last few years uh, for yellow peas. Um, and particularly for lower quality peas that maybe can't find a home uh, in some of our higher quality uh, market destinations. So this red share bar shows the share of these crops going to sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, especially for dry peas, uh, our second bit most important export customer is sub-Saharan Africa, and a lot of that uh, is that food aid market. Looking more closely to home, who's buying these things? Well, there are a limited but growing number of elevators and processors buying pulse crops. Um, this is a, a, just a, a, a map of delivery locations in the state. That accept pulse crops put together by the Department of Transportation. Most of these locations are are, are located on major rail lines, um, and a lot of these are sort of the typical uh, typical buyers of, of other crops. So big buyers like CHS and Columbia Grain are some of the uh, are are some of these delivery points. Others are pulse specific companies um, that really specialize. Uh, in buying pulse crops. And it, uh, as a pulse crop seller, uh, it's important to look around for at all market options, um, both in and out of the state. So we've had a growing number of delivery locations here in the state, but a lot of growers are still sh uh, shipping pulses up to Canada or east to North Dakota, where there are, are additional buyers and potentially additional market opportunities. Um, and so, uh, just because pulse crop markets are smaller um, and there's less information, um, it really behooves growers to go out and find the best bid uh, for, for their pulses um, on an ongoing basis. Try and get as much information as you can about price and about prices at different buyers. Uh, so what's been happening to prices? Well, this is sort of what's been happening to wheat prices. We can see Generally, over the last few years, since 2015, uh, when we harvested our 2015 crop, prices were trending down. We had a, a big jump in prices in the summer of 2017, uh, but that jump is largely ending. Um, and that jump uh, was much stronger for spring wheat here, this, this jump here in the, the middle blue line, than the dark blue line here for winter wheat. Um, so if we're thinking about, well, uh, you know, a wheat fallow rotation, a wheat fallow rotation hasn't looked particularly attractive over the last few years, and that's in due in large part to what's been happening to pulse crop prices. So uh, particularly in any given year, it seems like one of these pulses uh, just has uh, a tremendously bullish price, uh, price picture. We have really high prices. So in 2015 and 2016, that was lentils. Uh, the yellow line in this graph, we reached record lentil prices. That price dropped off um, as we had our 2016 harvest. We saw a little bit of a post-harvest rally in lentil prices uh, going through 2016 and 2017. And lentil prices have come down, but they're still at relatively high levels historically. So in that uh, 25 to 30 cents per pound range, uh, and that's a pretty good price uh, in historic terms. but uh, even as lentils have cooled off, chickpeas heated up. And now we, we've seen record chickpea prices um, over the last year or so and persisting through this current harvest period. Um, and so uh, just given that we're sort of at relatively high prices and a lot of that's driven by demand, there seems to be growing demand uh, for these crops both inside and outside the US. Um, given that, um, given that pulses have looked uh, relatively good in putting pulse crops in, in their crop rotation, 
uh, what are some you know useful things that things that they need to know um, before they do that? Well, I would uh, I would highlight two things. Obviously, there's a whole host of agronomic considerations. Just sort of uh, what do you need to know about putting this crop in the ground, uh, care, undergoing crop protection. You know, what sort of herbicides, fungicides do you need? Uh, to, to grow a, a high yielding, uh, high quality uh, crop of peas, lentils, or chickpeas. I won't focus on those, I'll focus more on sort of the economic considerations. And one of the key ones is that, uh, and key unique things about pulse crops is that contracting for pulses is a, is a little bit different uh, in that a lot of delivery contracts have uh, what's called an act of God clause attached to them. So if a grower is setting up a forward contract with a buyer, say, in the spring, you're planning on uh, planting lentils. Um, you go to your buyer and you say, uh, I, what kind of prices are you offering? And you agree to, uh, to deliver your, your pulses to uh, that particular buyer uh, at harvest time. Um, one of the things that's often attached to that contract is this act of God clause. And so the grower is going to agree to deliver a specific quantity and quality at a specific time. So say, a number one medium green lentil delivered at harvest time, say in August, um, and they're gonna receive a set price. So if prices fall at harvest time, uh, if the cash price falls, the grower is gonna still receive that, that price that they agreed to with the, with the buyer uh, at, in spring. But if they have a bad weather year, like the drought that we had in, here in 2017, uh, they can opt not to deliver. If they don't have the bushels, they don't have to deliver and they don't have to sort of potentially um, buy their way out of that contract. They just get they, they get the option to opt out, okay? Uh, the buyer, because they're giving the grower this act of God clause, often retains the option to purchase the remainder of the grower's uncontracted production. So the grower will contract uh, to deliver so many bushels per acre uh, and then whatever's grown on top of that, uh, the buyer often retains the option to purchase that, uh, say, at the cash price um, that prevails. So because there are some of these unique contract provisions, it's really important to read and understand uh, and talk about that contract with that buyer uh, and understand all of the provisions before you sign anything. Uh, there are some unique things that can occur. Some of those things are good. They, they're, they're protections for you as a grower, particularly that act of God clause. Um, but some of those things um, are, are options that you're granting to uh, granting to the buyer. And so you think about there's sort of a risk sharing that occurs in these contracts. The grower receives a fixed price, so they receive um, they receive this. Uh, price guarantee that if prices fall, they'll get paid uh, that specific price, and they get that option to opt out if one of those act of God events occurs. Okay, and those those events are often named in the contract, so it's important to know which events are covered and which events aren't. Um, but the buyer receives the right for you to deliver, and often the grower's surplus production. And so you might be sort of thinking that if you're in exchange for this act of God clause, you might be receiving a discount relative to uh, the price that is expected to prevail at harvest time. And so you've got to evaluate those trade-offs as you think about putting pulse crops uh, into your rotation. Other thing that's important to, to think about is understanding some of the risk management tools. In particular, right, we know that crop insurance is, is the most important is some of the most important government-backed uh, risk management tools that exist. Uh, exist in production agriculture today. There are also marketing loans uh, that are available, which act as sort of a price floor. Uh, but because post crop prices are relatively strong, uh, those current marketing loan rates are low relative to market prices. And the marketing loan program isn't really seen as a significant support uh, for post crop production. What is a, a bigger support are, are production and revenue insurance. And so these are uh, very similar to the yield protection and uh, revenue protection policies that are available for wheat uh, and other uh, major crops here in our state. Uh, a harvest price exclusion, where uh, 
uh, the grower can receive the higher of the springtime price or the harvest price is available uh, for pulse crops, just like it is for wheat. The price setting process is a little bit different because there's no futures market, no central market uh, for peas, lentils, or chickpeas. Um, so that's uh, in large part based on uh, transaction data that's collected uh, by the risk management agency and uh, crop insurance companies to help um, set that harvest price and that springtime price. Um, but it's not done in a public futures market the way it is for other crops. The other big thing to note, and this is going to come in uh, come in as important later, is that there are significant significant restrictions on the frequency with which uh, pulse crops can be grown uh, in a rotation and still be covered under these crop insurance uh, programs. Uh, generally, this is one in three years for peas and lentils. So on a given field. Um, you're only eligible to purchase insurance if you haven't planted peas on that, uh, say you're only eligible to purchase insurance for peas on that field if you haven't planted peas in the last two years, right? So you can grow peas uh, one in every three years. For chickpeas, that window is even, even longer. So at one in every four years. Uh, and that has to do in large part with some agronomic concerns, especially related to crop diseases. So the disease pressure uh, is generally larger um, uh, and, and more intense uh, the more frequently we grow these things. So it might be attractive, right, given incredibly high prices for chickpeas to grow as many chickpeas as you can. Uh, however, uh, your expected yield is gonna drop off pretty sharply if you start to include these things in rotation more frequently, um, more frequently than is optimal. Uh, and you're going to restrict your ability to purchase uh, production and revenue insurance. And, and given what we've seen um, with the drought in this last year, uh, having uh, some form of production insurance uh, is, is, uh, can be very, very beneficial to the grower. Okay, so to summarize, pulse crops have some unique aspects. We have a unique relationship between the U.S., and global markets were particularly reliant on a few markets, uh, especially that Indian market as a major source uh, of US pulse exports. Um, marketing contracts uh, and the way that pulse crops are purchased uh, are slightly different. Um, a lot of this is grown under forward contracts that have some unique provisions uh, and the cash markets uh, can be a little bit uh, can be a little bit more variable and a little bit more opaque than cash markets for, for wheat. Um, that said, and the other, the other thing, as I just mentioned, was there are some agronomic and insurance constraints on how often they can be included uh, in a crop rotation. So uh, even if we'd love to grow pulses every year, we've got to grow these things in rotation uh, with cereal crops like wheat. Uh, that said, Pulse crops retain some of the fundamental features of other commodity markets. Prices are variable. There's a seasonality in prices. We often see uh, a price low right around harvest time. Cash prices are lowest when growers have uh, are, are taking that crop off and have and there's a lot of crop in the country. Um, and they respond to supply and demand information from around the world. So we grow these things in a competitive market. Uh, we're not the only ones in the world. Uh, Growing, growing these pulse crops, and so we're subject to supply and demand conditions on a global level. So how do we think about including pulse crops in rotation? Uh, we looked at prices, and we might just think, well, when pulse crops are high, pulse crop prices are high relative to wheat prices, it makes sense to include a lot of them in rotation. And that's sort of what's been happening, what's been driving that increase in acreage that we've seen across time. So this is just, the ratio of the per bushel price of peas relative to the per bushel price of wheat. And in this graph, we can see that uh, back in the, in the 2006 to 2010 period where we had, even with, uh, uh, even with relatively high wheat prices, uh, we're still in this range where, post, where say pea prices were relatively equal to wheat prices on a per bushel, on a per bushel basis. Um, so 
Uh, this was slightly below one most of the time for spring wheat, uh, slightly above one uh, for winter wheat over most of this period. But then over the last uh, seven or eight years or so, we've seen a tremendous uh, increase in pulse crop prices relative to wheat. And that's driven uh, people to, to adopt these crops. And we were uh, at a, a P to wheat ratio of nearly two uh, back in 2015 and even into 2016, especially for winter wheat, when prices were relatively low for winter wheat in 2016, uh, peas looked like a really good option. That's fallen off a lot, especially as we saw a spring wheat rally. But in historic terms, uh, the P to winter wheat ratio uh, is still relatively high. It makes pulses look really good. If we did the same exercise for lentils or chickpeas, I think we'd see that um, pulses look really attractive. That said, uh, we can't just uh, think about prices. There are a whole host of other things that matter. So we've got to factor in all of the economic factors that affect the relative profitability of these two crops. Uh, some of those things that we're going to talk about are water availability, right? So, and the main crop rotations that we're going to compare here are wheat fallow rotations um, and continuous cropping rotations. Uh, that include both uh, both wheat and pulses. So one of the major factors to think about here is water availability. And when we're in a, a wheat fallow rotation, uh, we may be able to, to uh, conserve water, water that's not used by that pulse crop uh, relative to a recrop or a continuous cropping uh, situation. What's that going to, how is that going to affect the relative profitability of wheat? Uh, and, and particularly wheat fallow relative to uh, a wheat pulse, wheat pulse kind of rotation. It's go, uh, including pulses in rotation is gonna change our input costs and especially fertilizer cost is gonna be one of the things that we're considering, right? So one of the key benefits of pulse crops in rotation is that they fix their own nitrogen, their legume crops. And so uh, our fertilizer requirements for pulse crops, crops are substantially lower uh, than for, for non-legume crops like wheat. Um, it's going to affect our machinery needs uh, and thus the machinery costs, the costs that we can attribute uh, to, uh, to our machinery usage in a given year. We'll talk about how to, how to estimate those. Uh, there's going to be some benefits and costs in terms of operator time and effort. So one of the benefits of pulse crops right, is that we're not necessarily planting we're harvesting them at the same time as wheat so we can spread out our time and effort uh, across a wider window. That's a, that's a benefit, but at the same time, there's a cost to um, growing more crops, so doing different things uh, and taking the time and effort to learn how to, uh, to grow these, to grow crops, uh, to grow these pulse crops effectively. Finally, we're gonna spend a little bit of time thinking about um, diversification and risk. So, we know that uh, pulse crop yields can be highly variable, but at the same time, uh, they give us some opportunity for diversification. So not all of our eggs are in that wheat basket. Um, when, wheat, when wheat returns are low, uh, we might still uh, get pretty good returns uh, from pulse crops, and that can help sort of offset some of the risk of any one, uh, one crop in our rotation. The tool that we're gonna use uh, our enterprise budgets. We need to weigh the relative influence of each of these fact and other factors uh, in setting up uh, a pulse crop rotation. Carrie, I'm just taking another brief break. Thanks. So if you're thinking about estimating uh, the profitability of different crops, you might go say to your, uh, your accountant, your lender, your local extension agent, particularly if you're thinking about adopting new crops, right? Crops you haven't grown before, you have no historical information, you might need to get some estimate of of profitability. And so the source, one source that we're going to be relying on are crop budgets that are produced by North Dakota State University Extension. Unfortunately, we have no uh, sort of Montana specific um, est profitability estimates. Uh, 
but I'll talk about how to adapt some of these existing tools to your specific context. So if you were to go out and look at which crops are most profitable, you might look at these crop budgets produced by NDSU Extension and see that um, their projected returns for 2017 were highest. Uh, we see at the top of this graph here for lentils, mustard, and chickpeas in Northwest North Dakota. So those look like by far the most profitable crops. They had the highest returns above direct costs. And I'll talk about what those direct costs are, what costs were included. When we're thinking about profitability, right, as revenue minus costs, which costs are included in this calculation? But um, those crops looked the most profitable, and wheat really kind of looked like a dog, right? So profits here for wheat were uh, much lower. We want to think about what went into these estimates, what was excluded, uh, and how can we adapt these estimates to um, a particular context, that is, your the specific uh, revenues and costs that you expect to uh, incur on your farm. So before we before we go through that, it's sort of useful to define some terms. So when I'm talking about an enterprise, I'm talking about a specific product produced by the farm. This could be, for example, wheat, peas. It could be some of the livestock, uh, if that's a, a part of your operation. Uh, so if you have a dairy, milk, if you have um, if you have a cow-calf operation, uh, those feeder cattle. Uh, most farms consist of several enterprises, but uh, we're going to just refer to as an enterprise any one of these specific products. So each of these uh, crops listed uh, in this crop budget is going to be uh, one of those enterprises. And an enterprise budget analysis just compares those enterprises in which um, where some of the farms some or all of the farm's projected revenues and costs are allocated to the, each of those enterprises. Okay, and so this this graph is a form of enterprise budget analysis in that we're comparing the ret returns above a some set of our costs uh, for these different crops. We want to think about well, how do we go about uh, engaging in those calculations? How do we do those calculations? And then how does crop rotation maybe affect um, or change the way in which we should do those calculations. Okay, so some key concepts for enterprise budgets are, well, what are, what are we're gonna focus on two different categories of costs, what we're gonna call direct and indirect costs, and I want you to understand why those categories matter. Um, we're gonna think about what costs should be included in the budget. Ideally, right, all of our costs get included, because they're all um, expenses that are incurred in, the product, in, in production. Um, and all of them should be um, included in this enterprise budget analysis, but some of these costs are difficult to measure, and some of them are difficult to associate with a specific enterprise. And then finally, how can we modify these existing available budget tools that are uh, publicly available? Uh, these provide a starting point, but if they're not adapted to your specific situation, they're not gonna help you make good decisions uh, about uh, particular crop rotations that you might want to adopt on your own operation. So it's important to note that these enterprise budgets are a profit projection. They're, you, they're, it's useful to understand that they're a snapshot at a particular point in time at which we estimate uh, what profits might be. So these, for example, in these North Dakota state crop budgets, they are published every spring, and they're an estimate of production over the coming year. So in 2017, in the spring of 2017, they publish an estimate of what the 2017 crop will uh, profitability looks like. But obviously we don't know, right? Some of the revenue and cost items that go into that budget are known with relative certainty. We know sort of how much we're gonna spend on uh, seed or herbicide for a particular crop, but we don't know, right, what's the price going to be when I go to deliver this crop after harvest? Uh, what yields am I going to get? Uh, and some of those cost items, too, might be subject to some level of variability or risk. The important thing to note is that when we're going through this budget exercise, uh, we want to estimate revenues and costs on the basis of what outcomes are most likely. So we're going to use, for example, a yield estimate that's the most probable 
most likely uh, to occur uh, value for our per acre yield. We're not thinking about, so in some agronomic exercises, it's useful to have a target yield or a goal yield in mind and trying to hit that target, right? And optimize uh, our input use so that we can uh, achieve maximum yield. But we know that uh, production is subject to weather risk, right? The weather happens. And so um, it's not necessarily like most likely that we're gonna achieve that target level of yield. Uh, we wanna estimate all of these revenues and costs on the basis of what's most likely. And that's gonna give us sort of the best projection of uh, what the profitability of these crops are. Sure, we might hit a, a home run in terms of yields, uh, and that might make a particular crop look really good uh, in, our, in our sort of crop budgeting comparison, right? But um, ultimately to make these budgets comparable across crops, we need to go with the most likely scenario. So this is uh, a budget summary for, I'm, I just chose uh, four specific crops from these North Dakota crop budgets. I want to sort of walk through what's included in their budgets. Um, there's a lot of useful information here, a lot of sort of a lot of numbers and figures um, for these four crops. And we think about um, what so what goes into the, these North Dakota state estimates, and that'll help us sort of think about how we might want to adjust adjust these estimates. So we need first some projection of revenues, right? That revenue projection is just going to be our yield multiplied by the per bushel or the per pound price. So we have uh, a per bushel yield estimate and uh, a best guess about what price is gonna prevail in the fall. Now, obviously, right, um, this per bushel price estimate was a lot lower than prices that ended up prevailing. Uh, we saw hard red spring wheat prices that were much higher than 493 a bushel, uh, but that was our best guess, the most likely outcome uh, if we were thinking about this in the spring of 2017. So that gives us a, a per acre revenue projection. And we have per acre revenue projections uh, for multiple crops, right? I've just included four here. Uh, more information is available and you might wanna look at, uh, at revenue and cost projections um, for, for multiple, for more than, than just these four crops. I've also included a column here for fallow. And the important thing to note with fallow, right, is that there's no revenue, right? In a given year, uh, we're just going to incur costs. And that's gonna change, uh, and that's gonna really affect our estimate of rotation profitability. North Dakota State uh, classifies costs into two categories. Direct costs, and that's all the cost items that are included here. So seed, herbicides, fungicides, fertilizer, uh, crop insurance, uh, any fuel expenses, repairs to machinery, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other equipment, uh, some miscellaneous costs that you can go in and, and think about, um, and you go and look, look at what they include in those, and then also an operating interest expense. So, right, so the fact that we're pro most growers are going to be um, paying for these direct costs out of uh, an operating loan, and so the interest is due on that loan. Those are the things that get included in direct costs. Um, indirect costs are some overhead expenses, just sort of general costs of operating the farm, costs related to machinery, and then uh, a land charge. That's either sort of the, the cost of, uh, of renting ground or the co a cost associated uh, with owned land. And I'll talk about how that gets figured. Uh, to calculate, um, our returns, right, uh, North Dakota State takes revenue, subtracts direct costs, subtracts indirect costs, and gets uh, an estimate of what's called the return to labor and management. So we notice that one item that's not included in these budgets uh, is any, uh, any money uh, spent on labor and any return to, uh, any return that's allocated uh, to the farm manager or the farm operator. Um, and so uh, given that, um, for, for example, for spring wheat, North Dakota State was projecting negative returns to labor and management. That is, that there'd be no money left over after all these expenses were paid um, 
for paying for the, the labor that the farm operator incurred or giving them some return to their management, um, management ability. So that made spring wheat look relatively poor relative to some of these other crops. So for yellow peas, the return to labor and management was smaller, but still negative. The return to lentils looked really strong, right? If we could get uh, decent yields uh, and at sort of even a relatively reasonable uh, price expectation, sort of looking at these two numbers, we had uh, significantly higher revenue. Um, and even though the costs of, of producing lentils were slightly higher, um, our end of the day uh, net returns were going to be much higher uh, for lentils relative to uh, alternative crops. Now, so the devil's sort of in the details. How did they get to these to these numbers? Well, we need to understand some some key concepts, right? What's the difference between direct and indirect costs? So, direct costs are going to be those costs that are necessary to produce a specific crop, um, and are easily associated uh, with that production. So, obviously, our seed cost for wheat is the money that we spent on wheat seed, and not the money that we spent on lentil seed. And it's pretty easy to allocate those costs on a and and so out take our total uh, amount of money that we spent on on wheat seed, divide that by our number of wheat acres, and get an estimate of the direct per acre costs of growing uh, of growing wheat. Those indirect costs are much harder to allocate to specific enterprises. So uh, with things like land, machinery, and operator labor, it's hard to say. Well, you know that combine. How much of the combine, you know, the money that we spent, uh, uh, say, uh, purchasing and using that combine, how much of it was uh, for the wheat enterprise relative to the lentil enterprise? Uh, operator labor, similarly, right? If the operator takes um, a wage from the farm, right, how much of their labor was used on one crop versus another? Allocating that to that specific enterprise, um, and thinking about it on a per acre basis is considerably more difficult. The other thing that we need to think about here are that some of these costs are not necessarily directly observable, recordable expenses uh, in the farm's accounting statements. So especially if we're um, thinking of, uh, if we're doing our accounting on a cash basis, right, when we only record expenses when we have some outlay of cash, um, some of these expenses are easy to recognize. Uh, some of these are what, are, what I'm going to call non-cash expenses. And those expenses include depreciation and interest expenses on owned assets. So for example, right, how much of our machinery did we use up this year? How, what's, what was the cost of using our combine? Well, it's essentially how much of its value we used up in a given year. Um, that depreciation expense isn't necessarily um, a dollar amount that the farmer pays out of pocket to use that combine, right? It's a non-cash uh, expense. Uh, some of the costs related to own land, right? So if we, if if you own your own land, right, there's no payment that you make every year to use it. Uh, but there is the capital, right? The money that you have tied up in that land, and that's a real cost. Um, and it shouldn't matter, right, whether that land is owned or leased. We still have um, we still have capital tied up in owned land that's similar to the rent that we pay uh, potentially on borrowed land. And so we don't want to sort of make one enterprise look better than another uh, because uh, we grew that crop on owned or rented land. So in these budgets, we're going to include the same land charge. Uh, that's an estimate of this non-cash land expense uh, for each crop. And then finally, right, the operator labor and management costs. So what uh, an operator might pay themselves, what you pay yourselves out of uh, what's left over after deducting all the other uh, costs that the farm incurs might not be sort of the true cost of your labor and management, right? And so sometimes, so we can think of those as similarly as a non-cash expense. Okay, just to sort of think about depreciation, um, and I want to focus on this because um, 
The machinery needs for pulse crops sometimes are different than for other crops. Um, cash machinery costs, how much we actually spend on machinery can vary a lot from year to year. It doesn't necessarily measure the contribution to this year's crop of that machinery relative to future crops. So estimating depreciation, how much of the value we use of that machine we used up in a given year um, is, is usually seen as a better estimate of the true machinery cost um, in any given period. So depreciation is really just the process of thinking about what's the current value of the machine. And I've sort of just plotted that as a given point here on this graph, right? We know that over time, so as we move along the x-axis here, right, the value of that machine is going to decline as we sort of use up the machine by, by running it for more hours. We get to some value at the end of its useful life. And we just want to think about, right, how much of that machine we use up in any given year. The simplest method is just to think about a straight line between the current value and the salvage value. And think of that in any given year, right? The change in that salvage, in that, um, the change in that value in any given year as the, de the depreciation cost for that machine, right? So the simple formula for this is just thinking about the current value uh, minus the salvage value divided by the useful life. So what's the essentially the average depreciation, uh, average amount of depreciation over the use, whole use, useful life remaining on that machine. And that's going to give us a better estimate than say what we spend um, in terms of actual cash outlays uh, on machinery in a given year, right? So, um, and this is particularly true, right, if we're investing in new equipment, adding new equipment uh, used to purchase, used to grow, uh, say, a new crop, like a, like a pea or a lentil, right? We don't want to say that all of that new equipment um, should be included in the cost of production in one year, right? We want to spread that out over the useful life of that machine. Okay. Key thing to note here is that failing to properly account for revenues and costs can distort our estimates of enterprise profitability. And we want to allocate revenues and costs to a, the correct production period, right? So uh, if we have, say, fall applied fertilizer, we don't want to uh, include that in the cost of producing last year's crop. It's really uh, fertilizers that's going to be used up by this year's crop, and that cost should be included uh, in our estimate of the cost of production in this year, in this coming year. Uh, we want, this is key to the, this, this, this difference is the key difference between what's called cash and accrual accounting. Accrual accounting tries to allocate those revenues and costs into the production and period uh, for which they generate output. Um, the other thing to note here is that those non-cash expenses, those non-cash expenses, are often S economic or what are called opportunity costs. Um, there's something that can't be directly observed. They don't show up in, in our accounting statements, um, but they almost certainly aren't zero, right? So even if all our, our land and all our machinery is paid for, right, the cost of using it isn't zero, and we want to account for that, right? But if we put more hours on our combine, right, there's a real cost to that in the sense that we're using up that combine. It's not going to be worth as much at the, at the end of the year as it was at the beginning. OK. So just thinking about how were these enterprise budgets developed, uh, it's important to sort of identify different enterprises and the production units. Uh, in this case, the production units are, are generally always going to be acres. And we're going to estimate per acre revenue for each enterprise. That, I think, is, is pretty straightforward, right? We're just going to think about revenue per acre as price times yield. Um, we've got to determine what costs are associated with that enterprise, classify those costs as direct or indirect. We can go out and measure or estimate what those direct costs are. For the indirect costs, this is a little bit uh, more difficult, right? So we know that, say, we, we're, we're going to depreciate a combine by so much, by so many dollars in this given year. We can divide that uh, by the total number of acres, 
right, and get a per acre estimate. Uh, but then how do we allocate um, that per acre estimate to particular crops? We can do this on a basis of use. So how many hours we use this, uh, this machine say on one, cr uh, on one crop or another, and that can be pretty helpful, um, but there are alternative methods. Right. Sometimes it's appropriate to allocate a machinery cost solely to one enterprise because we have a machine, um, say if we're using a land roller uh, in the production of lentils where uh, we wanna get that, uh, and we're not gonna roll our, our wheat ground, right? We wanna allocate that cost, that essentially an indirect cost, it's not sort of, uh, it, that indirect cost looks a lot more like a direct cost. Allocate that to a specific enterprise. And then finally, we're gonna calculate that per acre profit, thinking about revenues minus all costs, both indirect and direct, that we've allocated to that enterprise. Okay, so a good starting point here is to use crop budgets that have been developed in as similar a context as the one that you're in, um, and start with that as an estimate, and then you, your accountant, your lender, your extension agent, and, and others can help provide useful information uh, that adjusts those revenue and cost estimates to your specific situation. Uh, this is hugely important because costs can vary widely from one farm to another. Um, and some of the decisions that you make uh, about uh, what machinery you're gonna have on your farm Right, there are high cost and low cost ways uh, of uh, planting, protecting, and harvesting a given crop. So those cost estimates widely, and it's important to adapt those to as best as possible to your specific situation. So going back to our budget here, uh, we can think about some of these some of these. Um, some of these numbers might not be particularly well adapted to your specific situation, and others, others might be better adapted. So this yield number, right, is obviously gonna be highly variable uh, throughout our state, right? Uh, getting a 38 per, per bushel uh, spring wheat yield is not necessarily a given. Uh, in fact, it can be particularly, uh, can be somewhat difficult in some parts of the state relative to others. So this is a number that we're gonna to wanna to adapt to um, our specific context. Some of these others uh, might be particularly good estimates. And again, some of these things are probably known, say in the springtime when we're making planting decisions, right? some of these are known uh, relatively well, and others of these uh, are gonna be uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat more guesswork. Um, so this price estimate, what price are we gonna get for this crop? We can look at what buyers are willing to, to pay us uh, in that forward contracting market, uh, but we don't know the, the end of the day price that's gonna prevail. Okay, so as a starting point, then how do we take uh, an estimate, just sort of thinking about, okay, we've got some estimate of the return, the relative returns to these different crops, how do we think about putting this now in a rotation context? So what we're going to do uh, at the most basic level is just weight those returns by the proportion of our total acres we wanna allocate to each enterprise. That's gonna give us a per acre estimate of the returns from that rotation. So we can compare, for example, a spring wheat fallow rotation uh, to uh, a more diverse crop rotation that includes uh, both cereals and pulses. So the two uh, the two rotations that I'm going to look at here are uh, the spring wheat fallow rotation, where we allocate essentially 50% of our acres to each crop, uh, to each of spring wheat and fallow, uh, and a spring wheat pea winter wheat lentil rotation, where we allocate a quarter of our acres to each of those crops. You can adapt this to your situation, right, by just calculating or determining the percentage of your acres that you're gonna to allocate to any one of these enterprises and using those as the weights um, in calculating your net return. So if we're thinking about the return to direct cost calculation, we can simply take 
the estimate of the uh, of the returns over those direct costs for each crop um, and multiply them by the proportion of acres allocated to that. So in that 50-50 spring wheat fallow rotation, we multiply 0.5 or 50% by the return uh, over direct cost for spring wheat, and then add that to uh, the weighted return for that fallow enterprise. So in this situation, I've assumed there's a slight negative return from fallow production. Uh, if we're chem fallowing that ground, we have to have a herbicide expense for that fallow uh, year. Um, we can look and think, think that our returns over direct costs are going to be the weighted sum of those, uh, of those two uh, returns from each of the crops. That gets us an estimate of the return over direct cost for the rotation of, in this case, 1891 per acre. We can do the same thing for the continuous cropping rotation. Multiply 0.25, right, the proportion of acres by the return by the return over direct costs. And in this case, we've looked. Notice we've used the same estimate uh, of spring wheat returns, uh, and add that to the weighted uh, return over direct costs from the other enterprises. So the P enterprise, right, had. Uh, higher returns, the winter wheat enterprise had lower returns, um, the lentil enterprise obviously right, had the highest returns, and that's driving this estimate here of the returns over direct cost for this rotation uh, to be significantly higher, right? So yes, we can grow lentils, but we can only grow them so often, so our, our returns per acre aren't going to be exactly the returns per acre from lentil production, they're going to be a weighted sum of all the crops that we include in our rotation. In this case, uh, that continuous crop rotation is significant, has exhibits significantly higher profits. There's a significant drag to fallow um, if we don't adjust these crop budgets in any other way. Obviously, now we want to start to think about how can we adjust those uh, enterprise budget estimates of profitability uh, for some of the things that we know about differences in crop rotation um, across uh, across rotations. So one of the things is that in those NDSU budgets, they assume that we're always in a recrop situation, that we're in a continuous cropping system. Um, and we might think that a, a wheat fallow rotation ha does have some significant benefits. Higher yields are possible uh, because of greater water availability, because we didn't uh, plant uh, a crop in the last year uh, and we didn't use up uh, soil moisture. What we could think about is, well, what does that do? It gives a yield boost to that, uh, to that, uh, that spring wheat crop that's grown on fallow, right? Suppose that yield boost is 15%. Um, what does that do to the returns from that spring wheat fallow rotation? Well, it's going to increase our returns over direct costs by uh, from about $53 an acre to $81 an acre, right? That significant yield bump doesn't do anything to our costs, really, uh, doesn't do much to the price that we receive, but it does give us a significant yield bump. Uh, and that makes that spring wheat fallow rotation look better. Not as good in this case as the continuous cropping rotation, road, uh, the continuous cropping rotation, but that might depend on the yield boost that you assume, right? And the and your estimate of your returns for a spring wheat fallow rotation relative to a continuous cropping rotation. Okay. So if we think about that just in this context now, right? What we've done is just adjusted our yield estimate up here, uh, made that 15, if we make that 15% higher, it's gonna increase our revenue and increase our estimate of the returns over direct costs. Okay. Moving from a spring wheat fallow rotation to a continuous crop rotation can allow for more efficient machinery usage by spreading some of those fixed costs of machinery uh, for a given machine over more acres. So in those NDSU crop budgets, right, assuming that we're in, a, what, the, what they do is they assume that we're using some subset of our machinery uh, for every crop in every year. So for example, our combine can be used on both our spring wheat and our pulse acres, 
We can use it over a longer harvest period, cover more acres, um, and reduce the per acre depreciation cost that's associated with a particular uh, enterprise relative to that spring fallow period, right? So if we go back to um, sometimes, right, moving from a wheat fallow rotation to a continuous crop rotation can do the opposite. It can generate some new costs for specialized equipment needed for pulse crop production. So uh, one example that I talked about already was potentially rolling the land uh, to uh, allow us to more easily pick up that, that low hanging, those low hanging pods uh, for those pulses. We might also think about investing in a flex header. So there's some, there's some crop specific equipment. Um, these should be allocated only to a specific enterprise. And so there's sort of a trade-off there, right? The given budgets uh, that are produced by NDSU assumes a recrop situation. Um, it assumes, for example, that the combine depreciation expense is the same for every wheat acre as it is for every pea or lentil acre. Um, if we think about these machinery expenses in a wheat fallow rotation, right, now we still have, um, we still have the same set of machinery, but we don't get to use it on those fallow acres. So what do we do? Well, one idea would be to potentially double our machinery uh, expense for wheat. Um, we could include those same indirect costs for fallow. That is, right, if we're thinking about allocating an acre to fallow versus, uh, versus lentils, we still have that same cost of, uh, of some of those machines. Uh, this is gonna make wheat fallow rotations look a lot less profitable. Right, and so in general, if we're looking at this budget, one thing to note is that um, in here, uh, if we're thinking about those indirect costs, right, it's almost certainly not the case that the depreciation and investment costs for that machinery are zero. Uh, it's probably more likely that they're pretty similar to the machinery and investment costs uh, for wheat because we still have all of that equipment, but now we're spreading those costs across fewer acres. Um, and in large part, that's driven, um, that's driven a lot of the switch that we've seen from wheat fallow rotations to continuous cropping rotations. So long as you can swing it in terms of not decreasing yields uh, because you're sort of moisture constrained, uh, you can spread some of these machinery and investment costs and the cost of land, right, over, uh, uh, over essentially over more acres that you, are generating more revenue uh, from the same expenses. The last thing to think about is that these given budgets assume fertilizer use is considerably lower for pulse crops. So if we go back to this budget, we can see that fertilizer expense for spring wheat was estimated about 43 uh, to $51 an acre, significantly lower for yellow peas because we're not applying a whole lot of nitrogen. Uh, on those pea or lentil acres. Um, that said, uh, there might be even larger benefits. And, and so agronomists have talked a, a lot about whether um, in a continuous crop rotation, we can lower our fertilizer cost for non-pulse crops because there's additional nitrogen left in the soil after we harvest that pulse crop. Nitrogen that wasn't uh, produced and used up uh, by that pea, lentil, or chickpea crop. Um, most budgets that I've seen don't incorporate a nitrogen credit, but what that's essentially gonna do is lower that fertilizer cost for those non-pulse crops, and it's gonna improve the profitability of continuous crop rotations. And so in your particular context, you might wanna think about uh, doing some soil testing and thinking about how much nitrogen is left by that, uh, by that pulse crop uh, that's used in that rotation. The last thing that we wanna think about as we adjust these budgets is to think about variability and risk. So crop budgets are mostly, are looking at sort of that most likely scenario. And your actual experience won't match your budget projection. There's just no way that that's true, right? Um, given when you make that decision in the spring, you need some projection because you don't have anything else. You don't know what's gonna happen with certainty. Um, but that said, uh, different crops might have different risk profiles. So pulse crop yields are likely more variable, especially for new producers, and that might make uh, 
uh, pulses not look as attractive relative to other crops. Uh, it's important to conduct, conduct some what-if analysis. Change your estimated prices, yields, and costs, and see how the returns to different rotations are affected by those changes. If you have a really bad year, if you have that, um, that yield catastrophe event, um, how, does the, how do, do those rotations look in, in terms of their returns um, for that, that wheat fallow rotation relative to the continuous crop rotation? The other thing to remember is that diversification has some risk-reducing value. It's hard to put a dollar amount on that. So if we think about um, our, going back to our budgets, uh, our budget estimates, right? Um, these are the returns to labor and management, but we know that we can't put all of our eggs into that lentil basket, even though it looks like by far the best option um, in, the, in these crop budgets that are estimated, in these crop budget estimates, right? It's not necessarily gonna be the case that uh, lentils are always better uh, than spring wheat. And so growing these two things together um, conveys an additional benefit, right? That if spring wheat returns are low, lentil returns might be high and vice versa. If we have a bad event with lentils, at least the spring wheat might pull us through. So to, in summary, right, I think it's really important if we're thinking about what are the re relative returns of sort of traditional wheat fallow type rotations and other rotations that include uh, a continuous cropping situation, uh, it's important to incorporate our best estimate of the relative profitability of the crops that we include in, in those rotations. Uh, and we need to, to the extent that you possibly can, adapt those estimates to suit your own particular situation. Um, if you're estimating a basic budget, do so based on the most likely rather than the best case scenario, right? Okay. Lentils look really good um, at average or above average yields, uh, but in a disaster scenario, uh, they, have, they do incur higher costs and um, may look significantly worse than, than, uh, than cereal crops. Uh, different rotations are gonna require different adjustments to the enterprise budget. So for example, right, spring wheat returns change based on whether we're in a, a, wheat, a fallow uh, scenario or a recrop scenario, right? Those spring wheat returns change for each rotation. And so it's important to develop um, enterprise specific estimates of returns uh, under each rotation scenario. Uh, finally, Incorporating risk is somewhat difficult, right? To think about, say, what's the benefit of being more diversified? Hard to put a dollar per acre turn, number on that, uh, but it's useful to think about, uh, especially given that we generally want to reduce risk uh, rather than increase risk. So with that, I'll stop. Um, I've provided my contact information. If you have any other questions about post-crop marketing, uh, post-crop economics, or the economics of including pulse crops uh, in rotation, um, I'm happy to answer those questions. You hit my email address, um, website, phone number, uh, and Twitter account are provided. Uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I hope you found the webinar.